good news you can use with Deborah Horn, yeah. She got the good news you can use, good news you can use for your life. So listen up, everybody, listen up, everybody. She got the good news you can use, good news you can use for your life. If you want to get the info that will help you throughout your life. Hello and welcome again to a special edition of The Boomer Beat with your host, Beverly Mahone. We have been talking with people around the country about their would have, should have, could haves, and how one little decision could have altered the course of their own lives. Today gives me great pleasure to bring to The Boomer Beat someone I've known since high school, Rhonda Rice Johnson. Rhonda, hi, how are you today? Hello, Beverly, I am doing well, how are you? I'm doing well, it's great to see you, you look great. <laughs> Good to see you as well, you look like you could be doing some cheerleading things. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you look the same, you haven't changed. Okay, well, I'm, I may not, I may look the same, but I know that body don't feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Rhonda, uh, take us uh, on your journey, you know, where you grew up and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Um, and I hope, you know, I, I hope I can remember, you know, um, and it's hard to, I guess, minimize it whenever it's been, you know, a 64 year journey. But I, uh, <laughs> I was raised in Canton, Canton, Ohio. And we were, I guess my earliest memories, we lived on Housel behind my grandmother, not far from Lathrop. And that was um, pre-kindergarten. And then I remember um, moving to, I'm trying to think of these, uh, it's actually a street in Canton. And I can't think of what the street is now, um, but off of Belden. Then we moved to, that area. And I went to Belden. I rem remember going to Belden from kindergarten to second grade. And then we moved to the Lathrop area, to Highland Park, which was, if you were living in Highland Park, you were living. Of course, that's not the case today. Oh, no, that's definitely <laughs> not the case today. You ain't living if you're living in Highland Park. Oh, okay. right, right. So we lived there for about... <clears throat> from second to sixth grade. And we, we, I think my parents moved because it started going down. You know, it started, like I said, in sixth grade. So then we found, a, my parents found a house on Monroe in Canton, right next door to my grandmother, Annie Louise Hunter. And um, from there, I went to Hartford Middle School. From there, went to Champion Vocational High School. Wanted so badly to go to McKinley. Ah, oh, because all my friends went to McKinley. My parents were like, no, you need to, you need to go to Champion Vocational. So I went there and I majored in business machines. So that just gives you, I guess, dex better de dexterity. You know, when you're typing, when you're doing the 10 key, which was, it was important to know how to actually operate the 10 key, op uh, the 10 key machine. And then after I graduated, I wanted to move to California. I had been to California actually several times. And I knew at the age of 10, I knew at the age of 17, I'm going to move to California. No plans, I'm just gonna go and live. You know, so my, I let my mom know this. And my mom said, uh, you have to have a skill. You cannot go somewhere and not have a means to eat. And she said, this would be a skill that you, will, you, you can use any time for the rest of your life at least you'll always be able to eat. And um, so I went through Barber College and that was about a 10 month course. And after that, three months later, I was packed up ready to go to California and uh, Morse Hall, which is Michael Hall's grandfather, drove me to California. Get out of here, really? Yes, oh, he's an, he was an excellent driver. That's probably the only driver my grandmother trusted, but he was an excellent driver. Uh, you know, despite despite the fact that he was a paraplegic. So 
I lived in California and I just lived. I went to, started going to college. I majored uh, one semester in art. Then I majored the next semester in business. Then I majored the next semester in music because education was free. But I never took advantage of it to complete anything. You know, just had it, you know, like when it's given to you, you just don't really appreciate it until you either have to work for it. So I lived out there, like I said, for about five or six years. Um, I met the father of my kids. I think if I missed something, I met, I met the father of my kids. And a couple of years later, we got married. I have three kids uh, by him. We were married for several years, about five, six years, and later on divorced. But my, my kids are just wonderful. I'm just so proud of them, you know? So that was some good in that relationship. And then the trip to Hawaii for my honeymoon. So that was wonderful too as well. Um, so I, um, I don't know if I'm saying too much or telling too much. I mean, I've, I've shared it and I don't mind sharing it. <laughs> but so I was um, divorced with my kids, you know, with three kids. And I think I was so embarrassed because I felt like I looked like a single mother with three kids, you know, like three bastard kids, but they weren't because I had been married, but they were, you know, 10 months, two and four. So they were small. But like I said, I was just so embarrassed that I was having to be a single parent. And, you know, even though my parents, they were strict, you know, they seemed strict, but you know, any household in Canton that had a mother or father, that household was strict. That was just the norm, you know, which is what I think families are missing now. Yes. But um, so I was actually divor divorced for 12 years. And I just knew before <clears throat> that time I would have met somebody, you know, that was my prayer. Okay, Lou, I'm going to meet somebody. But it's something because um, about 10 years after my divorce, I probably heard God's voice for the first time. And he said, you're going to marry someone that you've known for a long time. I'm like, oh, okay. I wonder who that could be. <laughs> and, <laughs> but mind me, when I first got divorced that same month, I wrote a letter to God of the kind of man that I wanted. My divorce wasn't even final, but I knew I wanted to be married and what that man had to be. So I always tell a young woman that's looking to be married or looking to find a mate, you make a three column list. The first column is what he has to have. And it's nothing physical, it's nothing tangible. It's about his character. The next column is what he cannot have. Now, mind me, I'm coming to the table with three children and a dog. And I had the nerve to say, I want a man with no ex-wife and no children. <laughs> and then my third column is what you can live or live without and that's to say, okay, and I just have like examples. His shoes are ran over. We can buy him some new shoes. He has a tooth missing. We can get some implants. So there's just things that you can fix and live with. So I kept that for 12 years. And I'm thinking, oh, God, you see what I want. I imagine you'll give it to me in about two or three years. 12 years or 10 years later, he told me, he said, you're going to, you're ready. And I'm thinking, well, no, Lord, I'm, I'm, I don't even, I don't even want a husband now. I'm happy. I'm content. You know, I got to that point of contentment. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, no, you would ask for a husband and you're going to get what you want. I said, okay. And I'm telling you almost to the date, two years later, a person came into my life that I used to date. He had probably five or six kids. None of them were his wives because he had never been married. You know, I'm like, oh. well, my Lord, that is not even, the, that's not the man on my list. So, with some, and I almost, not that I almost fell for it because I knew that that was not what I had asked for, even though I had known him 25 years. But the man that came into my life, who I'm married to now, and that's like another podcast because he <laughs> can tell the story so differently. But we've been married now, we celebrated 22 years Saturday. Oh. But we, we're in our 40s when we got married. He was 40, doesn't have an ex-wife, doesn't have any children. And he took a woman with three kids and a dog. And he said, well, you know what? I knew they were going to be growing up soon. But um, 
So like I said, we've been married, like I said, 22 years, but I had known him 36 years before we got married. Wow. He was wow. four. Yeah. He was four when I first met him. <clears throat> and he's a couple of years younger than I am. Um, but his sister and I are real close. You know his sister, Anita Johnson? Yes. Yes, that's my sister-in-law. I thought there was some connection, but I wasn't real clear on exactly. Yes, because yes. they look, I mean, they look yes, alike. Yes, I do. But we were, she and I were good friends, but she sort of not, not introduces because I knew him, but he was, you know, a kid in essence. But I remember when I first met him at the age of four and I was six, he was riding off into the sunset on a scooter. We were there for about a year. They were living in New York then. His father was in the military. I didn't see him for the whole week that I was there. It's like he would be on the base just running, just running everywhere. And I never saw him anymore. I'm thinking, I wonder where he went with that scooter and whose was it <laughs> anyway? <laughs> but um, so here I am in uh, Georgia. After I got married, I moved down to Georgia. Um, came down with my kids. They were, well, my daughter was 12. You know, and I wanted my kids to be of age. You know, before I brought a man into their life. Yes, yes. But um, they, um, the kids get along really well with my husband, and you know they're they're doing well. I now have four grandkids by my oldest son and his wife, and they're 19, 16, 12, and 11. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I remember when they were born. And then my other two kids are um, doing well. I have a son that's like a social butterfly that just wants to just be free. If he didn't have to work, he wouldn't because he loves to travel. Mm -hmm. Love to travel, love to hike, loves nature. And my daughter loves to hike. She loves to read. Um, she's an attorney in Decatur. And my son works for in, in a country club. But, uh, and my oldest son, I don't know quite yet what he does. He He's taking care of a family of four and a wife. So I'm sure he's doing something. And they travel quite a bit. But um, that's where I am and still trying to decide what I want to be when I grow up. I hear you. Know? you. So is there anything you would have done differently? I mean, now in, you know, in hindsight, reflecting back, would you yeah. have made some different uh, changes? Would you have, because you, I will say this about you. I heard you sing on Facebook. Oh, this mm -hmm. has been a few years back. And I, I kept saying, is that really Rhonda? She, you could really sing. And I was like, oh my God, she can really sing. Had you ever thought of singing as a career? You know what? Not as a career, because I mean, it enters my mind every so often. I'll think, I wonder if I at 64 can find, you know, I would love, I could, I would love to have like a trio, an upright bass, a drum and a keyboard. That's all I need or either just an acoustic guitar. I would love to find some place where I could do like weekend gigs, but the thought has come and gone. I just don't, not that I would not consider it, but it, it, it did, you know, cross my mind, but I never pursued it, pursued it, probably out of fear. Mm. Um, and let me see what I would have done. Cause when I was in California, I did, Right, not a lot of singing, but I was I, I was with a musical group of friends. They sang; they were awesome musicians, and um, did some background work for some people. But um, I really, I think I knew. That. And then my sisters have and I have sang as a group. You know, the Rice sisters have sang as a group. But um, like I guess I never. Like I guess it was probably the fear of whatever whatever that fear was that kept me from pursuing it. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. Hmm. That's what I wanted to go to school for, but I wasn't encouraged to become it. I wasn't encouraged to go to college. I was, if, if anything, I was discouraged by going, you know, from going to college and, um, was discouraged probably of some things that I really enjoyed because somebody said something like, oh my goodness, you can't be an artist because artists starve. You can't be a violinist because there's too many in the orchestra. What does that mean? There's too many violinists in the orchestra. So you can't, you certainly can't, you know, 
but just different things that, you know, determined because I, I was a person of, uh, that needed affirmations. And I took the opinion of the adult and that's what directed my path. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So you, you said that it, it, the hindsight, once again, is 2020. If you had it to do all over again, would you have married your first husband? Um, if I had. Because they do- say we always see things that we, we see, we see the issues. We ignore them. And that's the truth. Um, if I knew then what I knew later, no, I wouldn't have. But then I have the three beautiful kids. So that was the good that came out of it. But it's something because um, the day I met him, he lied to me, mm. my first husband. And, you know, lied from there on. And like I said, we lasted five and a half years and I lied till the, to the end, <laughs> you know, lies to the end. Right, but down to the last. You know, for that reason, no, I would not have. You know, but uh, yeah, we could just live life and say, okay, Lord, let me do it over again so I can get it right this time. You and know, so it now been... you feel you've gotten it right this time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. that was the, the man in the letter that you wrote about? The man in the letter, say it again. And when you wrote in the letter, you wrote the letter to God. Yes. Yes. The... Yes. This is, this is my husband now. He, he fit that bill. He fit that bill. You know, like I said, a 40-year-old man with no children, no wife, ex-wife. That's rare. It is. You know, because the older they get, the chances of you finding a man without children is almost slim to none. Right. But, um, um, and it's something because he was in Georgia and I was in Ohio by this time. And it just goes to show you don't have to date forever to have the right one or to know that you have the right one. Because when you start getting up in age, 30, 30, late 30s, early 40s, you know, you know a bust whenever you see a bust, you know? You don't have to date it for five years. Right. <laughs> right. Is there anything on your bucket list or do you have a bucket list that you have yet to accomplish that you'd like to do? I do. Um, do something. Yeah. I have, and I guess my bucket list is my vision board, you know, which is like three years old. And I'm having to change the date because I have yet to do, you know, some of the things. Um, you know, I would like to do more traveling. I would like to learn a language. Um, I would like to, what was the other thing? There are probably about about 15 things on there, but I know I would like to learn. I would like to learn how to swim, but I've always had a fear of swimming. But um, I know of an instructor that they said she can teach any adult. So I feel like I am, you know, when you're jumping rope and you're just rocking to get into, you know, you're trying to get the groove until you get in. (laughs) That's what I'm waiting on. I've been doing that for three years, but one day that's going to have me, I'm going to be jumping in the water. You know, so. <laughs> well, I want to be there to see that or at least get somebody to record some video. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's it. And like I said, travel. Uh, my husband, as a kid, loved uh, Japan. And I would love for us to go to Japan. Yeah. Okay. So, and right now I can't, I can't think of what else on that list. You know how. Okay. Any regrets? Um, any regrets? You know, that I did not, that I did not go to school, that I did not pursue, um, medical school, but it's not a regret that just has me. So, oh my God, I wish I had, I don't have any that are like that. If so, I don't remember them. Okay. But yeah, nothing that just has me so just, uh, of course, now I can't do it now because I'm 64. You know, I should have done it when I was 24. No, I don't have, I don't have anything like that. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, the thing of it is, is with uh, regrets at this age, what, <laughs> what can you do about it? Right. You either do it or you don't. <laughs> right. And let it go. 
<laughs> right. All right. So as we wrap up this uh, segment here, what uh, words of wisdom would you like to share? I was when when I when I saw that question, I was thinking, um, what would I say to my younger self? Mm-hmm. Which would be to, like you said, the younger generation, um, to be true to yourself, because yourself knows the truth. You know, sometimes people do things, and it's like, now you know that's not right, or you know that's not you, or you know, you, people do things for um, the accolades of other people. But be true to yourself. Um, also, um, as I tell my kids because maybe they would have done something. And, you know, I, I'll say, you know, it's, it's going to come back to you. You know, you reap what you sow. But the saying that I heard that I always enjoyed was, every dog has its day and a good dog has two. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> live your best life. But um, that's just to say, you know, you, you reap what you sow. So, uh, and then also, um, don't let the thoughts or the opinions of somebody else make you the rather don't let their opinions be the reason that you are not who you want to be, you mm-hmm. know, because you're trying to accept what they say rather than, you know, really knowing, you know, what you want to do. And I'm not saying not to take words of wisdom from people that have wisdom. But sometimes, uh, you know, if you have someone that's not encouraging you or is trying to discourage you, you want to, you don't want to listen to that or, or to just take it with a grain of salt. But then, you know, figure out what you want to do. And if you don't make it, try something else. But those are. Those are your parting words. Nuggets. Yes, those are my parting words. Well, those are some awesome parting words and I received them and I'm sure that uh, my listeners will receive them as well. Rhonda, thank you so very much. You don't know how much I really appreciate you taking your time. You are welcome, Beverly. But for this edition of The Boomer Beat, until next time, remember this, you have gifts to give the world. So find your own unique voice and prosper and remember to stay empowered along your journey. See ya. Thanks, Robin. You're welcome, Beverly. Good news, you news for your life. If you want to get the info that'll help you throughout your life, yeah.